Hi, I'm Paul Yeager. This is the MTOM Show podcast studio at Iowa PBS, and we are part of the Market to Market TV show. Sound familiar? That's what we talked about twice in 2023 as we set up a podcast with two producers, one in Oklahoma, one in Illinois. We talked to them at the beginning of the spring, middle of the summer, and now that the crop is put to bed, or as the case in Oklahoma, in the ground waiting to spring up, and some of it is sprung up, we're going to get an update on how things went for our two producers. We will start uh, with uh, Chad Bell in Illinois, and he updates us on what his crop is, and expectations is going to be the, the theme of the two interviews. The second one is with Mike Schulte. He is a producer and also happens to run the Oklahoma Wheat Association. So we'll get his perspective on how the Oklahoma wheat crop is looking. We're also going to get into some global issues about what's impacting trade, who's going to want U.S. wheat, who's growing wheat around the world, and what that means for Oklahoma producers in general. We'll also talk some weather there. So uh, him also mentions expectations. So I guess we could just call this episode the expectations game. Hey, in the last episode that we had, go to the end of the episode. I want you to look and watch that tag. Well, if you haven't watched the interview with April Hammes, go watch it again. But at the end, there's something very specific and it's about these types of things. Go back and watch that and uh, you'll explain, that'll explain my crazy randomness. But now let's uh, catch up with our two producers for our, rea- our wrap up of 2023 and the year that was for both of them. First, let's go to Illinois with Mr. Bell. When you look at the pictures behind you, Chad, I think I asked you this before. Do you dream of warmer days? Does it help to see, you know, what was the years gone by to make you long for March, April, May, June? Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't like the winter, t- the winter months anymore. Uh, I used to, but... You know, as I get older, I, I tend to agree a lot more with my dad than I used to. And that's where we should just stop right there. Thanks for coming. Life <laughs> has become full circle. World has yep. ended, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. What, uh, you, you know, I love the pictures. Uh, we've talked about them before in previous times. Um, the, the last time we chatted, it was very green. Yep. You had caught a couple of good rains. Yeah. Did you, was that enough rain to get you by? Oh, uh, so we, about that time is when we really did start catching some rains throughout the rest of the growing season. Uh, we did have another short, a very short kind of dry spell, but the rain that we had been getting, uh, we're still far below normal, but it, it was enough to get us through the rest of the growing season. And, and, uh, we actually had the best yields that we have ever had. On our farm, not by a lot, but it was still the best crop that we've raised. Did you think that was possible on June one? <laughs> Absolutely not. And I could, I if you would look at uh, how I marketed my grain through the growing season, that would reflect exactly what my sentiment was through the growing season, and that was that we weren't going to have a lot of grain to market. But I, I hate to be one of those farmers that says that said I thought we were going to have a disaster and next thing I'm I'm talking to you today about the record crop that we had so I mean I guess I'm a whiny i state farmer <laughs> Well, uh, April Hemis was a past guest on this podcast just a couple of weeks ago, and she's an I-State farmer. And she was in a 10-mile pocket where you go north, south, east, west. It was not good, but she did sneak in a good crop. Yeah. What do you... You don't have to be ashamed about that because there's other people who've caught it in other years. Yeah. Is that how you're... Uh, is that how you're... Tell, was that what you tell yourself? I, I mean, I I try that. I, I've done... I did the best that I could agronomically with the weather conditions that we had. And I actually did change. Uh, I did not fly fungicide on a on one farm in particular because it was planted later and, and just had a rough start and looked terrible. But uh, looking back now, if that was going to be a yield yield uh, advantage, I should have done that. But, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda. Do you think it would have been an advantage if you would have flown it on? Uh, probably in this specific case. Um, but I, it's hard to say without doing any of that. Yeah. Are you finding early season, mid-season, late season, there was a difference for you in how things ended up in the fall? Um, so... Not really. I mean, we had 
pretty well across the board. Every field that we had was the best crop we had raised. And it didn't really matter planting date, early, middle, or late. It was it was all really good. Um, and it's and it's kind of hard for me to say year in, year out, because we typically plant our best, highest yielding fields first because they're typically dry and ready to go early and lowest yields are planted typically later because those are the fields we're always waiting on. So it's hard to say whether whether the growing season had a lot of contribution to some of those yields or um, if it was just the usual kind of plan of attack. Has anything that's happened in the last six months altered what you're going to do in the next six months? Um, yes, for probably a reason. Uh, I did gain some acres for this upcoming year. Um, and so I'm going to have to adjust my marketing plan probably to fit those acres. And so um, I'll probably forward sell some more grain uh, in spite of these lower prices, but I, you know, we have lower input costs for the most part. Um, fuel is obviously not down and, and rent is obviously not down in most areas, but, uh, fertilizer was down seeds still seed is still seed. It's always going up every year, but, uh, some of the other more major inputs are, are down. So I guess marketing plan is, is changed because of my operational change for next year. Well, let's go back to your marketing plan then for this year. You said you wish you would have sold a little more. I think a lot of people always say that same thing. Yep. How are you approaching marketing uh, this old crop? Well, um, looking at my numbers, cost of production still, and uh, finalizing what my actual yields were, measuring the bins and scale tickets to see exactly what I have and going, going forward with that. Um, I have most of my commercially stored grain sold. And so what is in the bin for the most part is still unpriced. Uh, the plan right now is just kind of to keep my operating loan down. So I'm going to move, I'll be moving some grain here this winter, but typically my marketing program depends on the following summer, you know, May, June timeframe to get a boost in the market. So hopefully that works out well <laughs> again this year, but you know, it's it's hard to say what tomorrow will bring, let alone three, four months, five months from now. You've heard the saying, the farmer seems to have welded shut the barn door or the, the, the bin door. Yep. Is, yours doesn't sound welded shut. It just sounds bolted shut. Is that right? Yeah, lo very loosely. There, there might be four bolts and only one nut holding it all together. <laughs> But, ah, so a typical farmer operation. I love it. I love yeah, it, Chad. Yeah, and if we're going to call it a farm operation, there's probably some duct tape holding, you know, keeping the gap closed in the doorway, mm -hmm. something. So you're open to opening it if the price is right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I, my, yeah. my goal here looking for, forward this year is, you know, my operating loan interest is going to be higher this upcoming year than what it was before, and so I'm I'm really looking at my interest cost are uh, considering I have more acres for next year. So I'm going to be borrowing or using more money. So I'm, my goal is to try to keep my interest cost a little more in check than what I've had to in previous years. So that, that means moving, moving some more grain or being a little more aggressive at uh, making sales. And that's a topic that we kind of started to get into here in the last two months. It was that interest. When's the last time you had to really, I won't say worry about interest. You always have to worry about it. It's always a factor. But that it actually was maybe your headline in deciding what you were going to sell or not. Yeah, I, I couldn't even tell you when the last time was that I really, really uh, contemplated my interest costs because it's been next to nothing the last number of years. And so now that, now that that's a factor, you really got to watch it and be cognizant of it. Okay. You mentioned things will be a little bit different next year um, w w because of expanded acres, but look at the, the rain, the rain that fell here around Christmas in a lot of the Midwest, did that hit you? Yep. So I think, uh, I can't remember the exact days, but there was about a three day stretch where we had a uh, half an inch one day and then it was dried off the next day and then another half an inch on day three. And so, uh, we're still, 
we're still short of rain and moisture, obviously, but uh, I guess I don't know if it's good or bad that we're not frozen up yet. We're, we're able to take this, any moisture that we get now and put it into the soil for, for next spring. So I guess that's a good thing at the moment. Has that lack of moisture that ended 23 altered at all your 24? Or are you pretty much locked on an alternate basis or cover crop here basis and you can't really be at the whim of the weather? Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty much planning for just a what I guess we would consider an average year, whatever that means anymore. But just just kind of stick into the stick into the plan, not really deviating too far one way or the other. Yeah, and then that's probably what it's always like for you. Yeah, I, I don't I don't typically follow the crop prices for uh, changing or being heavy corn or heavy soybeans. It's pretty much uh, rotational for me, and and what make and that typically makes the most sense in my situation. So I need to take that question out of the market to market discussion uh, standbys of well, you know, could those acres flip? We know what the <laughs> acres are going to be. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I I don't typically do a lot of tillage anyways, and we do have one farm that we tiled last year and had to do some fall tillage on it. And so if anything, that would be one field that I wouldn't necessarily be locked in on, but I'm pretty certain it's going to soybeans, even with the extra tillage pass on it. Let's talk about, I think, uh, after the last time we chatted, you you had some cover crop or you had a crop in behind that you were anticipating. You were kind of sorting through. How did that all come out? Uh, so pretty good, actually. Uh, this was after the wheat, I'm assuming you're asking. Yes. Yep. So I, I put in a fairly diverse cover crop mix, and it was pretty pretty good getting up and going. I did have to wait on a rain for it to get established, but that rain didn't wait too long to come and uh, got a really good stand of an assortment of cover crops. And I did have sunflowers in that mix. And so about, oh, I think it might've been September, those sunflowers or late August, first part of September, those sunflowers bloomed. And so it was really nice to take a drive past that field and take a look at it and Pick a few sunflowers to bring home to the wife for a nice little bouquet. So I guess some extra points there. Just a reminder of, hey, I I am working. These are some of the things that I grow. This is for you, (laughs) honey, right? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Cover crop uh, in a dry situation. Did you contemplate doing anything differently with cover crop in October, November of of 23? Not really. Um, Not I didn't change anything based on the weather. Uh, I did change kind of my, uh, how I approach cover crops ahead of corn. And so I, I saved a wagon load of wheat from this past summer's wheat harvest. And I spread the wheat to on acres going to corn instead of using cereal rye, like I had in the past. And just to hopefully avoid some potential problems. I haven't really had a lot of big problems in years past, but I just wanted to reduce that risk even further. And how, how do the cover crops look right now, given that it's been dry, haven't had the snow cover? Everything looks pretty good for the most part. Uh, my best looking cover crop is my cereal rye and that a lot of my cereal rye was seeded, uh, late September, early October. And so I got a pretty good stand with some moisture on that. A lot of the wheat after soybean harvest ahead of corn was done a little later than what I was hoping for, but we've had an extended fall since we're not, we've only uh, kind of froze up one time and it didn't last too long. So we've, we've really had, even on these colder days, we're still getting some, some cover crop growth activity out of it. And and Mm. we get a stretch of some warmer weather, like forties or even low fifties, a lot of the cover crop or even the wheat crop I have out there is it greens back up for a few days and then it kind of goes back dormant again. Are are your neighbors, are you struggling to let that tractor sit in the barn, even though it could probably be out in December, January? Uh, so yeah, there, I personally have a little bit of anhydrous left to put on and, and I made, I think two, two different attempts at that uh, in some adverse weather conditions. And one time was too muddy and the other time was too frozen. So I, I just kind of decided 
I, I called my ag retailer and told them to come get the bar in the tank. I don't want to look at it anymore because I'll be tempted to go try it again and probably be, uh, probably fail one more time. So I just, I just had them come get it. But there, there's been still some opportunities here and there for a little bit of field work to be done. Uh, I've seen, actually, I followed today a, a strip till bar from a ag retailer and it looked like it had been in the field recently, maybe not today, but here in the last week, probably. That's strange, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's there's very. I know I've heard the heard some old timers talk about anhydrous being applied pretty much any month of the calendar, and and this past year was almost one of those months where, uh, or one of those years that mm -hmm. was almost that case where you could apply anhydrous whenever you wanted at a given month. Let's look at the other one of the other parts that you do, and that's the hogs. Um, I I don't know what to say because looking at that market each and every week gets tougher and tougher to do. What's the life of the hog farmer like right now? Well, luckily for me personally, uh, being a production partner, I'm a little more immune to some of those uh, market moves, like what we've been seeing. Uh, you know, maybe there is a day where that comes to roost in my hands, but at least at this point it hasn't. Uh, but just talking to the, to the people I work with, you know, it's been a struggle and they've lost a lot of money. Uh, but they have made some good decisions and good moves that, uh, yeah, they lost a lot of money, but they could have lost a lot more. Um, but so that's, that's really about all I know about the hog market from, from my standpoint is at least locally, it was bad, but it could have been worse. Kind of like the crop. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Chad, if you had to put a headline on 2023 from where you sit, what would it be? Oh, I'd say uh, the first thing that kind of popped into my mind was better than expected. And that's we hear that all the time. And this was one of those deals where just thought coming into June, May and June that we're going to have a pretty rough go at it. And I made some marketing decisions based on that. And hindsight 2020 should have, should have just kind of stuck with the, with the program, but better, better than expected yields, less than expected crop prices received. Well, we'll see how much uh, that phone is next to your ear to say, sell, sell, <laughs> here, here. The way 24 has started so far, though, it's not exactly a time to sell, but it also gives you pause of, great, could this thing keep going lower? And that's always that worry that you have to have. Yeah, and so I did I did have that exact conversation yesterday with my uh, grain merchandiser. He's, I'm still holding on to some commercially stored grain and I asked him yesterday when the market bean market was down 20 some cents, should I just go ahead and dump this? And his simple response was yes. And that was, that was kind of my mindset. I'd been thinking about it for about the last week and just had been watching the market go down, 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 and finally decided to jump out. And maybe I guess I'll see what that, what the ramifications of that decision is, but you know, it could be, it could con continue to go down and maybe that decision will look great. Maybe it won't. Who knows? All, all we can do. It's all we can do any year. Yep. And the decision has been made. Time to live with it. Yep. Chad, I appreciate your time all year and uh, kind of give us an insight. And uh, it's always fun for me. And uh, I hope uh, it wasn't too much of a, oh, here comes Paul again. <laughs> so. Nope. It was, it was a fun year. I'm, I'm glad I was somehow selected to be on the show a few times and really all right chad bell thank you so much appreciate it thank you appreciate it okay mike this is tv radio we we have to you which means you have to close the blind behind you what's the weather like there uh well we are fixing to get more rain forecasted this evening things look much different than they did uh, a year ago at this time in central oklahoma uh, we've also had uh, nice rains throughout the western part of the state, which is the majority of the wheat belt, uh, even in the Panhandle region. So 
Uh, I think that uh, producers are cautiously optimistic that things certainly are going to be much better on the production side for us this year uh, in this region as now we go into uh, the late winter months into the spring. A year ago when we first chatted, uh, it was a dramatically different story. There's no such thing as a perfect weather, but are you close to it right now? Uh, I think right now... uh, most producers would say that uh, that we're pretty close to it being uh, the best that it can be weather-wise. You know, if you look at the drought monitor today, uh, 3% of the state is uh, still in severe drought, uh, just very small portions. If you would have looked at the drought monitor from 2018 to 2022, uh, you would have seen extreme to exceptional drought over large portions of western Oklahoma in, in all areas. And so, it was really challenging during those times, especially last year, uh, when many of the regions maybe had anywhere from an inch to an inch and a half of moisture that they planted the crop on until three weeks before harvest. And so um, uh, we saw declines, certainly on production levels, uh, but it was really remarkable that we had anything to harvest at all last year, given, given the amount of rainfall that we had uh, in the wheat regions. When I just talked to Chad a moment ago about his crop in Illinois, his headline for 2023 was better than expected. What's Mike Schulte's headline for Oklahoma in 2023? Well, I think uh, as far as uh, crop considerations, that that's probably would be good from the standpoint uh, that we did produce something. I think had we had the same wheat varieties that we had been planting in 1996 when we had a severe drought and we didn't have a crop, uh, we would have we would have been in those situations. And I think you know, that's really a testament to our research programs uh, across the U.S. and what they're doing with drought tolerance and nitrogen efficiency traits. Uh, so it, it really is remarkable that we were able to harvest um, something. Certainly not what we uh, would maybe always want. Uh, of course, as producers, we always we always want to have the, the bin busting crops. And, and we did not have that this year, but uh, it was still better to have something rather than nothing at all. So maybe could have been worse. Oh, I think from a production side, absolutely, it it could have been much worse, yes. And it certainly could have been better. So I guess we'll just go, maybe we'll just do that M-E-H, the meh type of a year. Yes, I think that's probably the best way to to handle it. All right, you know, I'm trying to keep up with the kids' lingo. Uh, Mike, as as the year went on, the the rains happened, the pastures greened back up, the, the cattle feedlots got excited again because they could take some of those animals back. And just overall in general for Oklahoma, uh, how would you say that the year finished there? Well, I think uh, planting conditions certainly were much better this fall. Uh, we were able to um, have different options for planting dates uh, and we were able to get rains at the right time in a lot of areas. So we really had a, a much better start uh, this year than what we had had specifically given last year and then maybe the three or four years prior to that uh we really um now going into this period we have a lot of forage in the field uh probably a lot of more growthy wheat than what i have seen uh maybe in the last 10 to 15 years so uh i think that that um you know maybe might present challenges in the future but uh i would suspect or you know i think it's just known overall as you drive through western oklahoma uh, there's really not any poor looking stands. If they are, they were planted extremely late and they just don't have the growth that some of the earlier plantings had. Uh, but uh, one thing that we are uh, noting just as you go around the state, uh, even though uh, the number of the cattle herd, the U.S. cattle herd has declined over the last four or five years because of the long term drought, uh, it does look like we are turning more cattle out uh, on wheat pasture, uh, something that we haven't really done in the last four or five years. And I suspect now. We're going to see those production numbers from a feeder cattle standpoint increase uh, if we continue with this El Nino trend. That is a very interesting change in just a year, how things can go back to, we'll call it normal for you, or what is tr- more traditional, I guess, uh, for, for the whole circle of agriculture there. Uh, you mentioned the word future. What's 24 looking like here in, in wheat? Well, you know, I think for, for us, uh, we certainly um, are happy that things look better from a production standpoint for us in the Southern Plains uh, of the United States. And that's really from, I think, Texas all the way through Oklahoma and to uh, Western Kansas and Eastern Colorado. Uh, we certainly do have some challenges, I think, um, on the marketing side or have had this past year. And so 
I think producers are really having to sharpen their pencils or have had to, to be able to try to figure out how they're going to become more uh, intensively managed uh, on their operations to, to make things work. Certainly, we have had some challenges just from uh, global supplies of wheat being much larger out of the 22, 23 year. Uh, and I suspect as we go into the 23, 24 year, we're going to actually see uh, production numbers for worldwide production to, to go down. Uh, we're not going to see um, uh, increases. Uh, in fact, we're going to see probably a great large loss uh, in Australia, which they've come off of their three record crop production years the past three years. But as they go into El Nino, it's going to be a different situation for them. They're going to return more into a drier situation. It looks like they have probably about a third less of the production this year than what they had last year. Uh, and then I think as you look at EU and Kazakhstan and then even in the Ukraine region, they're not going to have as much production as predicted as what they have in the past. Uh, you're going to see us stay on par with our production levels, hopefully be a little bit better out of the U.S. Uh, Russia, again, is going to be um, a, a major factor in the market. I think they're going to be on par with their production levels this year, which they have been extremely high on the exports. And so I think we're still going to have to contend with that. But you are seeing um, some of the gaps narrow uh, on the FOB prices, certainly not where we want to be uh, right now, maybe overall, but we are being more competitive in the regions that are closer to us. So we are starting to see movement uh, specifically into Central America and South America for U.S. wheat. And we also did see China return to the market this past uh, month in December where they made a large uh, purchase of soft red winter wheat out of the United States, which certainly uh, ha has helped movement there. It, it actually has increased our export market to China over the last year by 256% already. So I suspect that people are going to be um, returning back to the market. And my hope is, is that we're going to be able to uh, have some better options for producers as we move into this year. You have to help me out here. And my, my DNA doesn't quite have the wheat gene in it where I, I know the huge backstory. But has wheat in your career, Mike, and lifetime always been this global of a story? Well, I think I think uh, it has. I think we've, we've had challenges in my lifetime when I was a kid of, of, of contending or being able to uh, be in the marketplace when Russia really kind of returned 10 to 20 years ago in the marketplace. And, and it's been a game changer for us because they have expanded their production uh, and they've been very aggressive in, in their marketing capabilities. Uh, the one thing that we continue to see, though, is, is that uh, world consumption still uh, today or as of today is, is outpacing production in this year. So um, as we see that and the, the need for the uses of, of trying to feed an ever-growing population, uh, it, it really just kind of takes one event. Um, and sometimes we're not happy maybe where we are on the side of that event. But if you have uh, an extreme drought condition in one part of the world at any given time, it, it really changes what producers are up against. And I think uh, for me, uh, just and agricultural producers overall, the, the challenge is, is trying to be able to figure out how to uh, market the crop given um, some of the environmental conditions that we're dealing with today that maybe we weren't dealing with uh, 15 to 20 years ago. Well, I always think each week on 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 the show, we're always dis for the last couple of years has just been two topics. It's been it's been Russia, Ukraine. And then every, we'll say six to eight weeks, Australia is mentioned. And then it's the domestic, you know, first it was the drought story for you. Um, whereas in the I states and the corn and soybean belt, they're always just looking strictly Brazil and Argentina, South America, and whatever China does. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned Central America. You didn't necessarily say South America. But what's the South America impact on wheat uh, that, that I don't understand here? Well, I think absolutely that, that several of the countries in South America also uh, end up being uh, in our top 10 export markets uh, and probably even in the top five for us here in the Southern Plains of the United States. I think that, um, you know, we have had some challenges on competitiveness of being competitive with the, the um, Canadian wheat market as well as areas of Russia. But um, uh, U.S. Wheat Associates did do crop quality seminars where we actually met with the millers and bakers in South America uh, back in November, and we did have long-term discussions. And I suspect that um, based on uh, the return of what we're seeing now from central United States and the return of China coming to the market, that uh, they're going to be having those discussions too with us. And my hope is, is that we 
we'll have uh, better export capabilities with them this coming year as well. In 2023, did your global look uh, from your from your full time job there? Uh, did it shift to you didn't have to? The headlines out of Ukraine and Russia weren't as dominant as they were the year before in 22. Oh no, I think I think they were actually maybe more dominant because um, you know we saw them really come strong and become aggressive uh, with just some of the situations they're dealing with uh, in order to fund some of the things that they're they're doing in that part of the world. And so I think that that has also made them more competitive uh, in the global wheat market. But, you know, starting from last year, uh, we really kind of had seen a price decline just overall. And we haven't really, we haven't really seen that that increase in, in price even yet today, as we're probably at, at all time lows over the five year average today. But, but my hope is, is that now that we are seeing people return to the U.S. market and we are seeing larger uh, export markets uh, of wheat that have happened now this past December, that hopefully we will we will see the benefit of that in the next couple of months, specifically when we've got a uh, world production actually chart showing that we're most likely going to decline in the 2023-2024 year to be maybe more comparable with where we were during those 2018 uh, to 2020 periods. Yeah, I read just uh, not too long before I started talking to you about Russia uh, with a very large crop. And I I think you said earlier to me before we started recording, you expect Russia to be on par with that. What what are you hearing about Ukraine, though? Uh, They are going to they're going to have a slight decline from what uh, we are seeing. I think part of that is actually accessibility to be able to put into the export market. I think that uh, certainly right now Russia is kind of controlling how that is all just being distributed from that that part of the world. Um, you know, it's not going to be maybe a major loss uh, in the global marketplace, uh, specifically unless there's just some something that happens in that part of the world that's going to really, really change um, even more uh, opportunities to export. I think the biggest thing for us uh, that's going to be beneficial from from a marketing standpoint is the the loss that we're going to see in Australia due to the El Nino Mm -hmm. effects. All right, Mike, we've talked about weather outlooks. We've talked about uh, geopolitical in the sense of who's buying, who's selling, who needs crop. But what's that other thing Oklahoma producers of wheat are kind of, we don't, not necessarily not talk about, but what is that thing we don't know about yet? (laughs) Of course, I need you to predict the future uh, that's out there that producers need to be aware of and just kind of keep an eye on in 24. Well, you know, I think that uh, certainly here in the Southern Plains of the United States, uh, we rely a lot on our markets in Mexico and Central America. Uh, We did have two rail crossings uh, into Mexico that were closed out of Eagle Pass and the El Paso regions uh, three days prior uh, to the Christmas holiday. They were they were actually shut down on December 20th and then they were reopened on the afternoon of December 22nd. But um Fortunate for us, uh, they were able to open those crossings up within a three-day period, uh, which was beneficial. But, you know, they were having to reallocate uh, positions or individuals at the border crossings to other parts uh, or other places where we were having migratory issues in the southern plains of the United States. And, um, you know, it's it's, it's really uh, an impact that I think we all are watching as we move forward. But I think as agricultural producers, we're really concerned that we keep those border crossings open for for movement of our agricultural exports. Uh, you know, we had 10,000 train cars sitting on each side of the border that were not moving. And so if you look at just those two crossings, uh, the impact would have been if they'd be closed all year would be 450,000 uh, different rail shipments that would not be in the marketplace. And so certainly has an impact on the wheat market um, uh, where Mexico is our largest market but really a, a large impact over agricultural products out of the entire United States overall. Yeah, I saw the press releases come in and I, I there was those were numbers I had I did not know uh, just the significance of, of the wheat market. So, uh, well, thanks for getting the crystal ball out there and, you know, predicting the unpredictable. <laughs> all right. Mike Schulte uh, from Oklahoma, I appreciate all that you've helped me out with this year and uh, kind of given us a perspective of what's happening. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Enjoy the the talk, Paul. My thanks to both Mike Schulte and Chad Bell. I appreciate it. If you have an item that you think would go well, like a coffee mug from your operation, or uh, maybe you have a bin or a bobblehead that you think we should put in, send it to us 
at Iowa PBS, P.O. Box 6450, Johnston, Iowa, 50131. And we might just put it here on the shelf, whether it's a lard can or we got the shelf over here that could use uh, some new accoutrements. Next Tuesday, the next episode of this podcast comes out. We will talk to you then. Thank you. Bye-bye.